absolute pleasure and honour to introduce to you Marcus Klaus, Professor of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Zurich and a diplomat of the European College of Veterinary and Comparative Nutrition, specialising in animal nutrition, digestive anatomy and physiology and its impact on welfare. He's a member of EASA's nutrition group and is a leading, highly respected scientist in his field and well known within the zoo industry for his work in zoo animal welfare and nutrition publishing a plethora of highly influential papers, which I'm sure many of you have read and referred to on many an occasion. So it is my absolute honour that he is giving his time and expertise with us today. And I pass the floor to you, Marcus. Thank you very much, Sally. Just I'm trusting that everybody can hear me and I will get a sign if not. Thank you very much for, enjoying, for inviting me to this um, webinar series. And I'll go right into the topic. I... We don't have your video on yet, though, Marcus. Okay. Okay. People want to see me now. You want to see my presentation? <laughs> we got yeah. <laughs> okay. So this, I titled this "Beyond Enrichment," and I did this for a reason because I think one of the things that are really important in our zoo, you call it industry or the zoo people, is the words that we are actually using. And maybe you've seen comedians use these examples of euphemisms that happen all the time, like, you know, something like global warming or something like pornography that doesn't sound so nice. We invent nicer words for that, like global warming becomes climate change because change is something positive that's not so threatening. If you, I want, want something with adult content, it even sounds like something decent, you know. In the zoo community, we have a euphemism that I find horrendous. And this is a euphemism that we use for standard decency that we should give our animals. And I'm convinced that the standard decency, this is what we call enrichment, as if this was something extra, something that is, oh, if we have the time, we do some enrichment. But, you know, an animal like a black bear whose diet is scattered along in nature and he has to go searching for it everywhere. If you do scatter feeding for an animal like that, you're not enriching it. If you lump feed it, that's pauperization. So I think if you're using the word enrichment, you give a certain attitude about the kind of standard husbandry that you have. And I'd be very careful with this and also careful about how we teach about that. There are other examples for names that are, I think, important. For example, if you call an animal an omnivore, what are your associations with that? And what does a label like that mean? I find a very interesting example in this publication on wild boar, where in the abstract, because it's a pig, you know, and we all know pigs are omnivores. In the abstract, they write it's an omnivore. And then one of the results of this review is that the diet is like about 90% plants. Why would you call something that eat, eats 90% plants an omnivore? You know, we just do, we are so used to those labels. And actually, if you think about something being an omnivore, I think the association is, you know, you can feed it whatever you want. It will eat anything, even garbage. But if you would look in the literature, you would see these animals are not eating everything all the time. They have se sequences depending on the season upon the availability that are not reflected in a label like omnivore. Similarly, another really dangerous word is frugivore, because if something's called a frugivore, we think, oh, well, we go to the supermarket and we buy fruit and feed that to them. And we tend to forget that the fruits that we have available in the supermarket have been bred for human taste, contain much more easily digestible carbohydrates. Here in this picture from Charling Hussmann, visualized as sugar cubes, then fruits have in nature the so-called wild fruits. So just relying on words can give some strange malconclusions, I think. Of course, sometimes we need generalizations. Like when we did a study on the length of the mammalian intestine, we want to classify them as animals that eat animal matter and herbivores and omnivores. For that, I need a general classification like that. But if you work in a zoo, the situation is not like, I'm coming to the zoo today and 
let's see what kind of animals I have to take care of today. Oh, it's a bear. What is it? Quick, we have to decide. No, if you have a species at your zoo, you will keep it for many years. And there's no excuse not going to the literature, going to the details and using the detailed information much rather than something like omnivore. And that's also important how you talk about these animals in your zoo. When we talk about diets and words that have been used to describe diets, there's this dichotomy in the zoo animal feeding history, two ways of providing or mimicking natural diets. And it's um, symbolized by two Swiss people. This is the kindest person I've ever met, Hans Wackenagel, who's dead now, and um, Mr. Hediger, to people that work in Swiss zoos. And the approaches to feeding are symbolized like that. The Radcliffe Wackernagel approach is you have a complete feed where all the nutrients are in there as the animal needs it together with all the supplements. And very often this translates into the one pellet for the species. And we tend to consider this somehow artificial. You don't really like that. On the other hand, there's the Hediger approach, who said that you should feed whole feeds like whole fruit or whole pieces of meat or whole grains. And you choose those so that they resemble the natural diet. But the question is, of all these whole things, what can be considered natural? Like easy example, milk, cow's milk is only natural for cows. It's not natural for hardly any other species because milk has different composition. I already talked about fruit or the colorful vegetables not resembling anything in nutrient composition that is in the wild. And for me, the most impressive example that everything that derives from grains is not natural. Think about a strategy that a plant would evolve to be successful, would that be shedding all its seeds at the same time? That would be completely stupid. It would only be good if it's domesticated by humans and we want to harvest them all at the same time. All the grains that we use have been, they are, you should call them artificial because they have been changed by domestication of humans. So calling these kinds of food natural is probably not the right approach. We should say these are chopped, minced and supplemented and these foods are, they're whole and they're not supplemented. And we say we have problems with this approach because they, we don't have the typical physical structure like things like fiber for ruminants comes to mind. In the production process, it might be difficult to limit some things like iron, for example. On the other hand, if you feed these whole forages, there might be selective feeding. Some animals might only take the fruit, but not the other stuff that you're providing. And very often they will not have all the nutrients that you need. For example, again, all the fruits, they don't have calcium, for example. So you know that a typical approach is that if you want to prevent animals from feeding selectively in this scheme, and from not being getting a deficiency, well, you chop the fruit, you mix it, and you add a supplement. And now you have this situation where you have chopped, mixed, and supplemented, and chopped, mixed, and supplemented, and you think this is artificial, this is natural. The point is, a lot of people who work with animal husbandry, they like to do this. But what's the point? Why spend time with something you can outsource? And that is actually not the core business of someone looking after animals. If you're looking after animals, you should be concerned about the animals. If you want to chop veggies and put powder on it, maybe you should be a sous chef somewhere and work for the dessert on the menu. Now, when we're talking about the welfare of animals, the question is, which welfare is it that we're concerned about? Like this example that I showed also in the ENG conference, you have complex enclosures and you pride yourself that you're feeding whole prey to these animals in those enclosures, which is actually a good thing. But the question is, where does this whole prey come from? And the typical answer would be, you have a supplier that breeds, for example, rats, just like lab animals. And now we are so concerned on the welfare on this side, but you know, those animals, they are, they are animals first. They're only prey secondly. So they are systems where you can also keep your prey animals 
in a better, more natural, more enriched way where you have a harvesting system down here. I'm not going to go into that, but you keep them so that their welfare is higher and you don't forget them. But if we take this one step further, if you think this is not good prey animal welfare, then of course this is not good prey animal welfare either. In other words, if you think this is a better prey animal welfare, if you allow rats to breed freely from their own groups in larger enclosures that are structured, then of course this is also better prey animal welfare. When you keep carnivores, you have to kill something to feed them. And the question is, where do you do that? Do you do that where you don't see it and you prevent your own animals from breeding? Or do you ask yourself, where is welfare better? Is welfare better on this side or is welfare better on this side? If you think welfare is better on this side, you should evidently close your zoo. So I think most people will think welfare is better on that side. So if you are concerned about animal welfare, you should feed animals that you breed in your own zoo rather than buying them from somewhere else. Actually, the same situation would also apply to something like vultures or hyenas, where you can wonder where is the welfare better in your zoo or where you <laughs> outsource the production of the meat and you could even use carnivores for feeding them. It's few zoos that are proactive about this, but there was this wonderful example of um, one zoo that gave in its yearly report um, this year in Germany, not only the animals that died, but also the animal that died because they were used as food in the yearly report. So an approach to even expose the public to this thing. And by the way, how can you support conservation in situ? Like natural parks where animal, where elephants will live and will breed and will multiply. If you teach your audience that killing something like an elephant is not allowed, how will you then help in situ projects where at some stage populations will have to be controlled? You see, I'm coming into this point where I'm talking about the messages that you have, the narratives. And here I come to the um, slide where I say feeding has different implications. And of the different implications that it has, we're going to go through all three of them. One is you tell a story. By the feeding regime you have, you tell a story not only to your visitors, also to your keepers, also to the young people that you educate in the art of animal husbandry. If you see a picture like that, what is the story? Is, for me, the story would be something like, we show you that you, we can maintain wild animals and human care with diets that have nothing to do with natural diets. Yeah, but we, everybody knows a giraffe evolved to eat leaves on top of trees. What is your story if you feed it carrots? I don't know what this, what it is that you want to tell your visitors in a setting like that. It's like we are concerned with welfare and conservation and we think it has nothing to do with feeding natural diets. What's the story visitors will get when they see a monkey with a banana? Is your story like a PR campaign for a banana company? I think if you give bananas to your primates, the real story that you are telling is at our zoo, we think it's okay to treat animals like cartoon characters because that's what animals like King Louis eats in the cartoon bananas. By the way, we justify this by saying conservation is important, but it's the message you're conveying and it's the education that you're providing, not only to visitors, also to your own people. Of course, we feed so that animals meet their nutrient requirements. And to cover that point, I'm gonna do just a super fast zoo animal nutrition history. And let's, I wanna put it like that. You have your different animal groups and historically, these animals are fed stuff that humans also would like to eat. 
or maybe diets that come from agricultural husbandry practices. And when you do this, you get your classic deficiencies, like anything that is linked to pure meat, to grain products or to fruits and colorful vegetables, for example, will be deficient in calcium. And if you give your primates enough fruits and vegetables, they will just not have enough calcium. If you feed your carnivore only meat, they don't, won't have enough calcium, blah, blah, blah. So at some stage when people realize that the way to deal with this, to get rid of the deficiencies is you add a supplement, like you powder your material, and then you don't have your typical nutrient deficiencies, but you have the, then you realize that there's other problems like the civilization diseases, animals become obese, they don't know what to do, you have abnormal behavior. So now I would say this is, or this should be in the past. Now we are at the stage where we use diet items that resemble more than natural diet items in terms of physical structure, also in terms of nutrient composition, and we reduce the impact of these problems. If we then use an adequate presentation, which would be this thing that we still tend to call enrichment, we might get rid of these problems altogether. My point here is enrichment is not adding something, is not giving a special treat. Enrichment is presenting the food in such a way, challenging, meaningful, that the animal has to work for it and has something to do. And that comes to this big point that we're gonna spend the rest of the seminar on. We feed animals to influence their behavior. For example, look at this plot where we have activity budgets from these are a number of different zoos where they observe the giraffe from different publications. I plotted those. And you see the amount of time spent feeding or the amount of time spent stereotyping, the amount of time just standing around. And then you can compare that to data from the wild, where apart from not observing any stereotypes, the feeding takes a much larger proportion during the day. Of course, this means those feeding regimes, the food either is too high in energy or it's found too fast. If you want to get to this point where animals are foraging and feeding all the time, you have to modify your feeding regime. In the literature, there's one publication of one zoo that actually managed to get to quite a long feeding time for giraffe. And if you would read that publication, Schussler et al., you see they spend enormous effort to provide the animals with mainly browse. Now, if something like this is your aim, you have to have an idea of what is it that we want to go for so that you can then measure in your own animals and see whether you have to adjust. This is something where you have to go to the individual literature. But let's just assume some very rough common rules here that I want to talk about, about the diet niches, the feeding behavior, and what that means for feeding frequency. I personally love this seemingly complicated graph that starts in the middle at a small body size and towards both sides we increase in the body size of mammals. This side is towards the herbivores, this side is towards the carnivores. If you are a very small animal, you can actually live on things that are small like pollen, nectar, insects, seeds, in that scheme they should be down here, you will find enough of them to fill your energy requirements in a day. You might have to look around, but you will find enough of them. But once your body size is larger, you can't at a certain body size, let's say like a baboon, you can't live on pollen anymore. You don't find enough of that in the course of a day. You have to go for stuff that's more abundant, for example, in the tropics, fruit. And if you become even larger, like a bison, you have to go for the stuff that's super abundant, the grass that's growing everywhere or the leaves that are everywhere on the trees. At that body size, you will never find enough nectar, enough fruits, enough insects to meet your energy requirements. So that explains how body size is linked to a shift in diets. Let's not talk about the aquatic herbivores here. If you go to the other side, if you're a small carnivore, you will go for smaller prey, often smaller than yourself. 
And this is a scheme that might even apply once you become larger, especially in the marine realm where you have something like dolphins or sea lions that go for prey that is distinctively smaller than themselves, but it comes in nice lumps in schools of fish. Let's not talk about the baleen whales here, but if you then go for the large carnivores, they can't go for the very small prey anymore. This is not a physiological problem. If you have a tiger, you can feed the tiger with mice and it won't have any deficiencies. But in the wild, a tiger will never be able to catch enough mice in a day to fulfill its energy requirements. At that size, they have to go for packages that they can actually get. Those will be the larger ones. You have very few, very large omnivores in the mammals, and those are the bears that have these special situations. On the one hand, when they have the berry grows, where they can harvest all these tiny berries. On the other hand, where they have something like salmon run, for example, where you have a lot of prey lumped in one place, even in terrestrial habitat. Now, how do these animals eat those different kinds of feeds? What's their foraging mode? If you're small, and you're going, for example, for insects like this shrew, you're basically running around searching all the time. And this is something that goes on to the right-hand side. If you go for the larger herbivores, they're basically always constantly feeding. There might be feeding bouts, but they're feeding throughout the day. Maybe it doesn't look as hectic as with, with the small screw, shrew, but they're feeding a lot of time. When you go for the smaller carnivores, I would call this hunting mode something like agility hunting because of the body size difference between the carnivore and its prey. It's mainly difficult to catch these small things. And you can see this in the seals or in this um, wild cat up there, the serval, that it's just a matter of, can you really get it? It's not a really exciting moment in terms of, Ooh, is it dangerous or not? The overpowering is not an issue, but it's whether you are skilled enough to get the food. But then you go for the large carnivores. And I want to symbolize this with something like a huge, a massive hunting event where prey is hunted sometimes that can even be really dangerous for the carnivore itself. This is something that happens not several times a day like these here, but something that is a single momentous event. So when we're thinking about these foraging modes, then we would say, okay, these things here, the small ones, they're basically constantly feeding you have the herbivores that are also, well, feeding in several intermittent bounds to constantly, basically. Something that people often overlook, the small carnivores have a very frequent feeding mode. If you think about something the size of a domestic cat, it would have to feed like 10 mice per day to meet its energy requirements. But then you have these massive hunting events. And that's a rare thing. That's not something that happens several times a day. This is maybe one or two or three kills per week. Now something will happen that will happen several times. I'm going to change my PowerPoint because of the different videos that are in there. It requires me to have this in several different pieces. So now we've heard about the feeding frequency. How do we translate this into our human care? If you have something that is basically feeding the whole day, you would want to feed this something like 20 times per day, small stuff scattered around. It's really difficult to do that. But what you could do is use these gadgets like you see up here that you can program to scatter feed like several times, 10 times, 15 times a day. You saw it just scattered the food. And now the meerkats are coming and they're looking for the pieces that have been scattered. And this is something that you can set this machine to do for like, yeah, like I said, 20 times per day. So you spread out the feeding and you don't have lumped feeding events. When we are thinking about primates, especially the great apes, frequent feeding events like five up to seven times are state of the art. If you go for the large herbivores, basically what we want to see is a constant provisioning of the food so that they can eat all the time. Now, how do you do that? And I want to use a scheme 
as an example for that, there's something that happened to me actually when I visited a zoo once. People show me a really nice enclosure with all kinds of different structures and then they complain, you know, the animals are only using that part of the enclosure. And you know why, you know what is the answer, of course. This, so all this structure is not really used. This is where the stable is. This is where the bedding material is, so the animals can lie down to have a rest. They are fed inside the stable and, oh yes, we also provide food outside of the stable. It's next on the stable wall. They have water inside and outside and there's this mineral lick on the outside. And if interaction with the keepers happens, like training, like some enrichment, that also happens in that area. And you know the answer why this is so. The answer is because this is where the keepers have their kitchen, where they have their office and the time when they, where they do their coffee break. And I'm not saying that it's the keeper's fault. It's the fault of the person who organizes that kind of work. Of course, you could use the whole enclosure if you ensure that the resting place is completely somewhere else. You don't give water in the stable area, but you provide water across the enclosure. The food is not directly here. But let's go first for the mineral lick. You hide it somewhere in the enclosure so the animals go there. And the food is spread all around, not so that anyone will fulfill the whole requirement for the group of the day, but you spread it across different locations so that now the animals would actually use the whole enclosure structure. You might ask where's the enrichment and the love coming in, but you know, the enrichment is the fact that the animals are using all this structure. The major problem with this is who wants to go out and fill this, fill this, fill this, fill this, fill this, fill this, even if it's raining, it's much more convenient to just have one place for feeding down here. There are some solutions how this can be done in a smart way. For example, there are these different feeders that you can set up in your bear enclosures that will release food at different times, even depending on a sensor with a transponder of the bear, whatever. But the point is, with this kind of feeding regimes, you want to have it spread out across the enclosure and ensure by the feeding that the animals are using it. And you need smart solutions for that. Now, with the agility hunting, you might get something like frequent feeding, for example, if you combine it to these kinds of displays or shows for your marine mammals. But what about the smaller cats, for example? Like I said, a feral cat would eat something like 10 times a day, a mice. Imagine an animal that has evolved to always catch something and then eat it completely. And it does so maybe 10 times a day. And now you feed it in this manner. You feed it in the mound that is everything it needs all on the same time. Do you think it will stop feeding after it has eaten a tenth and then go back and then come back later? Maybe some do, maybe some don't. This kind of feeding has been linked in the literature to the obesity in domestic cats. But think about these rare events where the large carnivores eat something and then gorge themselves and then don't hunt for one day, two days. And now think about a lion in the zoo and you feed it every day exactly the amount of food it needs according to the daily requirements. What will this animal feel? It will feel like I'm okay, I have all the energy I need, but it will never feel, feel a full stomach. This is something a little bit, you know, a little bit schizophrenic. Something like this should feel filled and digesting only but it doesn't, but it doesn't need energy. It's a strange situation, it has been linked in the literature to one of the reasons why these animals would do stereotypies. Now, when you're thinking these carnivores, there are several issues or things that we de that has evolved in the zoo nutrition history, how to make this kind of feeding more interesting. The first thing you might think of is something like physical challenges. You don't want to feed something like hamburger meat that can be digested completely easily. It's better to have whole carcasses because then it's different structures. It's more difficult to disentangle that. But of course, you don't want this without the fur or without the feathers. You want to give the animal the whole thing so that they actually have to work for this. Like um, in this video, provided to me by Anita Borkevica. Borkevica. She provided several of the videos I'm gonna show you now. So the animals actually have something to do and it already takes longer to eat this than the equivalent amount of hamburger meat, evidently. When you're looking at two videos that show wild dog feeding, 
evidently it's nice to do this up here but if you do this with whole prey the animals have a much longer time that they will require to process that food and you will get to longer foraging and feeding times when you're thinking about polar bears and about the most boring way that you can think of of feeding an animal you look at the video on the left hand side where the food is just there that's it how exciting can that be for an animal and how many animals in your zoo are fed that way you could devise other ways of feeding your animals where they actually at least are a little bit active as shown in this video on the lower side with um, something like a show element where the animals are actually using those ponds evidently this is easy in terms of keeper time this is intensive but you know as well as i do there are so many different enrichment devices feeding methods that have been published that are used to make the feeding less easy so that the animals have to work for it not using any of this would require justification in my view i'm gonna switch a video again i'm gonna close this one don't save that and we go to a next session of videos it's just two so again a video by anita showing a very simple method how feeding is made interesting for these two tigers and it's just a pulley system and they don't know that they're doing this to each other but as you can see it might not look like a lot of action but they are using all the force that they have to pull and to keep their meat another way of doing this would be to use something like a moving platform and it just makes getting to the food more difficult for this animal combined for example in the here with a bungee cord then you have already several difficulties that the animal has to master to get its food it's better than just putting the food in as such and again we're changing videos here closing this going to a single slide presentation everybody i think knows about pole feeding that has been especially in, in zoos in the uk that's something that can be done with whole prey as you see in the middle or on the left hand side you can put it do it with just carcass pieces you can make it go off easily from the top you can attach it to the top more strongly but the animals will use muscles that they would also use in overpowering prey it's something like you can see on this video you can even train your animals that you have several in the same enclosure and again i would say if you keep a tiger or a big cat you would have to justify why you're not doing this there have been has been even a study showing that the skeletal system is better in animals that have been on a system like that for a longer period of time than animals that were just fed from the ground and we are also going from this to another one where this is my favorite video for wild dog feeding where the food is actually out of reach when the animals let go but there's this fire hose and one of them has to sacrifice himself and pull this one is not doing it very efficiently but another one is showing him now this is how you do it so that the others can get to it wild dogs work for each other so you can actually use such a system with them and this will never get boring the next day or then after two days whenever you want to feed the next you will have the same situation because it's just physically challenging to get there and some of you might know this um this place in the netherlands where they provide a facility for all the different for different large cats and they've devised this feeding system where at the moment it's the person who's running the system getting familiar with the joystick but then the lioness will be brought out and they're using the feeding to make the animal actually do some work for its food actually looks quite nice i think this is not the natural feeding when the animal have to hunt in the air but evidently this is a bigger moment than if you just dump in the food or the carcass but all those kinds of devices might not always work it does not necessarily prevent boredom 
I want to show you two videos. One is about a pole feeding event in Jaguars. And I forgot, it's either on this pole or on the one that's on this side that the food is actually put up. And you can see how excited the animals are to get to their food. And this video runs for something like 12 minutes or so until the animals decide to climb one of these poles where the food is on. Not really exciting. Or this video from the Stifting Leuven where they have this cougar in the enclosure and you can see how excited it is to follow its meat. It actually seems as if it was bothered by the meat rather than wanting to go for it. So a question is, what is it that makes this kind of feeding method enriching, really successful? What is it that you lack sometimes? And whenever you talk to zoo people and you think something's lacking, one of the answer comes is, you know, everything's so predictable. Everything happens at the same time. We need to include, introduce randomness in this whole thing. Whenever I hear this, I use this Christmas tree as an example um, to make my point. Imagine you go home tonight and your family surprises you with a Christmas tree and they say, ta-ta, it's Christmas today and you get all your gifts and you should feel so enriched because you did not see it coming. And the point evidently is, especially with Christmas, we want to see it coming. We are actually counting down the days in December until it arrives. Think about a tiger kept in an awful cage here. But what is happening here? You know what is happening. Feeding time is coming. This is the one exciting moment for the animal. Would you want to take that moment away by just randomly dropping the food from above so that the animal did not see it coming. Anticipation is being recognized as an important component that we have to consider in welfare assessments. Pure stereotypies are something different from anticipatory pacing because anticipatory behavior actually means the animal at least feel has a tiny bit of control because it, know, it knows what's coming. And there have been nice studies, for example, this one in dolphins, where people can actually show that depending on the motivations the dolphins have for a certain thing to come, like human-animal contact, then when they get the signal that signals, okay, now this is coming, not the control signal, they show more anticipatory behavior because they are, so to speak, looking forward to that. Now, I had my personal moment like this when we had a circus in our vicinity, in our neighborhood. We have a pasture in, behind our garden. And at a certain time, several years ago, that was used by a circus to put up its tent and also the enclosure for the tigers. This is not a photo of that event, but it was similar. So for a week, every evening when I come home, I had, so to speak, tigers in my backyard and I couldn't observe them. And what you could see when the animals were out here and then the people were flocking into the tent, the animals were very tense. When they came past each other, they would rawr and lash, lash, leash out with their claws. And they looked unhappy, let's say, running to and fro and me, typical zoo person, I would think, ah, typical circus thing, uh, not such a good husbandry, the animals don't like it, they're stereotyping, pacing around, whatever. And then the animals run inside into the tent, and then after, I don't know, eight minutes or so, when the show is over, they come out completely calm, completely relaxed, they rub against each other, they rub against any pieces of metal that they find. I could even hear them purring from something like 30 meters away, and they're relaxed because I think they had something to do. An animal tuned to hunting, they have a big event that they're looking forward to. Now, something like this happens. What is it you do? You Google it and you realize you're never the first one to detect something. Actually, this was in 2005. I made this observation some, somewhere 2015. So 10 years before I had made my observation, somebody had published this. I had not been aware of this, but it was about pacing in circus tigers, which increases a lot in before the performance and afterwards the wonderful relaxation. Do you think you can have that without that in an animal tuned to hunting? 
And that got me to thinking, when you hear about these, um, where people link the amount of stereotypies you observe in carnivores to the home range size in the wild, and people say something like, you know, if animals have large home range sizes, they will stereotype more in captivity. And this is why we, for example, should not keep polar bears. Actually, when you go to zoos, this is something that you do observe a lot that polar bears are stereotyping. You could say, you look at this small enclosure, the huge normal home range, but look at this polar bear in its huge home range. What is it doing? Is it running around? Actually, this is something that we see a lot of times. You have a polar bear stereotyping. The food is lying there, but you know, it just stereotypes. This polar bear here sits still sometimes for hours because it knows if it moves, it will not get its food. They are tuned to a hunting method like that. But this animal knows no matter what it does, the food will be lying there. Imagine you train this animal and you to a signal that says, in the next three hours, you will have a five second moment when you can get your food. And if you're not alert, it's going to be gone. What I want to say, anything you do doesn't matter if you cannot fail. This is what we tell our kids. You can't train the violin all the time. Sometimes you have to go on stage and play it. You can't train your soccer team all the time. Sometimes you just go and play against someone else and either you win or you lose. It doesn't matter, but you perform. And what you do is you might fail with our zoo animals. Do we ever give them a chance to do that? I tried to find videos and the only one I found is this one where I think the setting is not so nice, but at least it gives you an idea of the principle that if the animal is not alert enough, it might just happen that, yeah, if you're not fast enough, the food is gone. And maybe next time you're more alert. I mean, this setting with the running close to the fence is not so nice, but the principle is you want to give them something where they can fail. I have three more slides, uh, several more slides, so I'll be in time. So what could you imagine here? The lines that go out of the enclosure, carcasses that you pull out if the animal doesn't pull back hard enough. Do you make those ice holes for polar bears that have a small opening window only after a signal? This would be up to you to devise a system where the animals can fail, where you can actually handle that. And I think that would be the terrific next step in carnivore nutrition. So what I wanna say, it's not about temporal predictability, with the regularity and the boredom that might come with it. It's about signal related predictability. There's a signal that says it's showtime, maybe now, maybe in the next half hour. It doesn't mean I will get food, but it means I will have to work for the food and maybe I will get it or I will get it, but I will have to work for it. Or maybe I have to be really alert. I finished this talk with this video of a carnivore doing something all of you know if you have kept the dog. It's actually dreaming. And you know what dreams are good for. Dreams are for a coordination of our memories, especially, not only, but especially of our movement memories. What kind of dreams do you give to your zoo animal when you leave home at six o'clock in the evening and the animal goes to sleep? If this is how it was kept, what do you think it will dream of about the distance it could walk here or the food that will always find the same place, as opposed to giving it something to do, having to work for it? Then the animal has something to dream about. I think, thanks, by the way, it should also apply to raising young ones because then you always have something to do that is interesting. So to sum up what I talked to you about is, I think words matter a lot. If we use a word enrichment, we make a statement about what we think our husbandry is. Using words like natural for something like an apple, which is completely artificial food, we give messages when we use words. When we consider that life always comes at the cost of other life, we need to consider the welfare of everything. And it might mean that we can control welfare better if we actually breed what we feed rather than buy it somewhere else. Feeding 
should not be nutrient delivery anymore. We have the ways to deliver the nutrients animals need. Feeding nowadays is mainly about the occupation that we give to the animals and the message that we deliver to our public. We need to have an idea about the activity budgets that we want to reach and we have to have husband targets for that and there are so many different tools that we can use to employ that. Unfortunately, it will mostly mean more effort, not less effort. So we have to find smart solutions for that. And the final point in the summary, making animal life meaningful, I think for a lot of animals means we have to imply a nice way how they can fail. Like with kids, you cannot have them never ever compete anywhere. The same with our animals. We can't keep failure from them all the time. I thank you for your attention and I will stop sharing my slides now and hand over to Cell to handle the discussion. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you. Okay, we're back on. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, so we're going to do a Q&A session now. So I will give as many of you the opportunity to speak to Marcus as possible. So if we could please start with Louise Jacobson, please. If you could unmute yourself. Hello there. Hi. Um, I'm a strong advocate of uh, browse provision for giraffes and other leaf eating animals. Uh, and particularly around giraffes, when speaking to various collections over the years, uh, Pascal's pets are very popular to feed up to them, saying, oh, it's a cage of trees and all that sort of thing. When, when asking a uh, feed company one point, you just say basically the whole tree, wood and pop, everything chipped up and performs a pellet. So what are your view of using Pascal's pellets as part of giraffe diet, considering composition of the structure and nutrients? Okay. I personally do not think that acacia twigs and leaves are special when you compare them to the leaves and twigs we have here. Um, you know that the Boscos pellet at last time that I checked contains 50% other stuff. It's not only the, the acacia bush that they use in there. Um, you ship it from South Africa. Why don't you just chop up leaves and twigs up here and use them? It's just to think that there's something secret in acacia that's not another i would not think it and if you can it would be better to use real brows than a pellet but if you want to use the pellet then boscos is good in terms of the high fiber content but you can produce a high fiber content anywhere in the world and not ship it around the globe that would be my opinion on that yeah agree thank you very much Thank you very much, Louise. And if I could now pass to Stuart Webster, please, if you could unmute yourself and you're welcome to put your video on. Thank you. Hi, Marcus. Thank you for that. Marcus, I'm a donor to my local zoo and it always concerns me about the amount of time the gorillas spend sitting down and doing nothing. And I heard what you said, that the best practice is five to six times in a day. Are there tools or machinery that we can put into the enclosure? You talked about the electronic for the meerkats, but are there ones specifically built for gorillas to distribute the feed in throughout the day? Okay. I, the question was, I couldn't hear it very well, but I think the question was whether there are specifically gadgets for gorillas that can be used. I'm not aware of that. To my knowledge, this scatter feeding, like I showed you for the meerkats, this is also something that's recent. This is not something that's being used routinely in meerkat husbandries all over Europe. Something I would hope becomes more nowadays. For the great apes, the only ways that I know is that keepers actually feed six or seven times a day. And this is something... I, I understand that this is problematic. If you come historically from a certain setting and a certain amount of keepers that you have, and now you ask everybody to do more work, you have to cut down somewhere else. But to say we just keep on running as we are is also not the solution. You have to find a way of doing this. The pellets can be scattered by machines like that. So you might use that to you distribute a high fiber pellet several times a day. Then you would have to make sure that this is at times a day where they actually want to go for that and not have um, like another feeding with um, apples and bananas in half an hour that they would then go for and rather outweigh the time. 
but um, I can only say there are no standard solutions for that at the moment. And it's the, for me, this is where the zoo community has to make the next step, get to the next level in animal husbandry. And everybody is asked to come up with solutions for that. At the moment, I would say, talk with the keeper team and try to figure out a way that you can increase the number of times. Like, don't put all the brows at once, but split the same amount of brows over two different feedings because that will make a difference. The animals will have less wastage if you make it scarcer at each feeding. It might take convincing, but if you like your animals, it should not take too much convincing because you will see those effects, how well it affects behavior easily. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Marcus. If I can now pass to, I might pronounce this wrong, apologies, Lena Call. Lena? Do we have Lena with us? Okay, I will move on then. If I could go to, again, apologies for the pronunciation, um, Daria Zebriva. Uh, yeah, uh, it was almost correct. No, that's fine. Um, I really liked uh, the idea of uh, giving the animals the option to fail in uh, catching the food. Uh, and it does sound uh, like more natural, but uh, considering uh, food safety regulations, like uh, what are the options, like what can you do with the meat uh, uh, if the animal fails to catch it, like, can you just give it to someone else? Because I assume you couldn't just put it back into the fridge and uh, try another day, right? Yes, I think you're right. And this is a serious issue here that needs to be solved some way. So if you have several animals that you could give the meat to and somebody fails, then you can give it to someone else. I think that sounds like a solution. However, of course, in case the first one catches it, you need to have something for the other one also to try. So it's not going to be easy. Um, I, because, you know, I don't work in a zoo and I'm not super, I'm not the one who has to take, put stuff in the freezer, take it out, etc. I would say this is a challenge that we need to meet and we need to come up with something here. And maybe this is not something for every day of the week maybe this is something that you only do once i remember that i once read a study that said something like i'm gonna say now to get for humans there was this test that you d if you have a test and you you don't have to have a 50 50 failure rate to feel good when you make it you just have to fail every now and then to feel achievement so it's not something that you have to provide on a completely everyday basis maybe but the animal has to know that it can happen and even doing this only let's say in every fourth feeding attempt might already show an effect this has not been studied you know there to my knowledge there's not a single zoo that feeds that way maybe there are some and i don't know about them but i've never seen it myself there are no publications on this so any idea that you might have how you can start this would be really valuable and ex especially also sharing it then with um, the community. But this is a challenge that we need to face and solve. Thank you very much. Now I have a question to ask on somebody's behalf. Um, he's asked, in your opinion, so what's your opinion on the value of combining randomized feeding with non-random cues, such as introduction of a smell or a sound? Um, I, I don't really know what, what is meant here, but it's for me, it's, I think if you do something like, I don't know when you would do randomized feeding. If you do use it for a herbivore, I mean, the food should be somewhere around anyhow. And if you do this with the, with these apes, I mean, and you do something like five feedings a day, there's not a lot of randomness that you can introduce there because there's only so many ways that you can split up five feedings across a whole day. So um, I personally would think if it's possible, and I'm not an animal trainer, so if it's possible that you can give cues to the animals, 
that tell them something about what is going to be happen happening at some stage later, that is terrific. Like imagine that you have your tigers and of course you don't only do pole feeding or nothing, but you do the pole feeding and maybe on other days you do something like a swimming platform or you, some instances you do. I know a zoo that does this um, rope pulling the, uh, the, the audience against the jaguar and they, I mean, it's never getting really out, but already gives something. And you train the animal to understand different signals in the morning so that it knows, okay, this afternoon it's going to be the pole or this afternoon it's going to be the swing platform. I would already think that after not such a long time, animals will know what that signal means. And then they have to think that their life is filled with something that they know is going to happen and they can think about it or maybe they decide not to think about it. So I think this signaling is something that should be used to make life interesting. Maybe, maybe even for herbivores, you could do something like this with salt licks, that you don't provide the salt lick on a daily basis, but only three or four times a day, combined with a certain signal that they know, ah, later today there's going to be the salt lick. Who knows? But it would be something that is an addition to their mental life compared to not doing it. Thank you very much. And if I could now pass to Holly Cole, please. Holly, if you could unmute yourself and you're welcome to put your video on. Do we have Holly? No. Okay, so we've lost Holly, no problem at all. Um, so Lena has got back to me. Um, bear with me one second. Oh, Holly's, Holly hasn't got my key, so bear with me a second, I will just find her question. Apologies for the delay. So. So Lena's put, um, how can I ensure my animals, for example, zebras, eat enough times a day, um, considering if the hay is too high in energy? Yes, it is known that you can have equids become fat on roughage only diets. It would mean that the ideal thing would be to change to a different kind of hay, um, especially with, I mean, basically with all your zoo herbivores that are large, you would want to get a high cut anyhow, a late cut in your hay so that you have um, lots of stalk, lots of lignified stalk, so that the nutritional value is not so high. Like for a zebra, you wouldn't buy fine early cut grass hay. That would be a strange decision, let's say. So it, it's a matter of adjusting the forage that you have to the species that you intend to feed. Like a, an early cut fine grass, you might maybe use for something like a small antelope, like dikers or so, but well, <laughs> not grass hay for them anyhow, but not for a large, for any large things. Maybe except if they are in lactation and you want to boost the energy somewhere, then it would be a good idea to have a higher digestible grass hay with them. Thank you very much. And with that, we are dead on 11 o'clock, spot on. So thank you so much. Thank you to Laura Myers, tech support behind the scenes today. Thank you to everybody for joining us. And obviously a huge thank you to yourself, Marcus. That was absolutely fabulous. And um, if any of you would like to watch that again, um, please do, please share. It is being recorded and we will advertise the recording shortly on the IAZA Animal Welfare Facebook page. So please join that. And, on and our if website. anyone wants to ask a question, you can email me at my normal email address. You'll find it on the web. And I couldn't see that what was happening in the chat. But if you want to email a question, I'll be happy to answer an email if it's not like 200 ones. Thank <laughs> you for listening. Nice. There are a few we didn't get to. So that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, so, so please do, do join our Facebook page. Please feel free to download and share Marcus's webinar, share far and wide. Um, and yeah, final thank you very much to you, Mar Marcus, for joining us today. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye, all. Bye, everyone. Thank you.